This week, we welcome Jason Healy, Senior Research Scholar at Columbia University, to discuss, are we winning new ideas on whether the new national cybersecurity strategy is working and defenders are getting better, faster than attackers? In the security news, ubiquity vulnerability, oddly specific, turn your flipper into an air tag. You dev persistence, locks are vulnerable, lots of them. EDK2 updates, DHCP and Windows admins, old software, unpatchable vulnerabilities, hack RF, pwn to own updates, and playing chess with your brain. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Identity is at the core of every great digital experience. Ping Identity solutions support the scale, flexibility, and resiliency required by enterprise-level IT teams for lasting digital transformation. With 99.99% uptime and over 3 billion identities under management, they're the only identity vendor that's proven to champion the scale, performance, and security of large enterprises. That's why Ping Identity champions your unique identity needs. They give you the tools to offer your users the right access at the right times, no matter how they connect with you. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. Are you ready to go beyond pen test reporting? Elevate your offensive security and measure risk reduction by streamlining pen test planning, report creation, and findings delivery. Request and attend a one-on-one personalized demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack and PlexTrack will send you a Starbucks $10 euro or pounds gift card totally free just for your time. That's securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack. Welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man for whom I have no words this week, Mr. Paul Isidore. Coming to you in super low definition from G Unit Studios. No, no, no. For no, now, no. I guess we're not in F, super low. F, F Unit, unit Studios. I guess F, we're F Unit no, 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 Studios. No, no, no. And we're not in super low definition. And it's F U Knit. F U Knit. It's Paul Security Weekly, episode number 822, <laughs> being recorded on March 27th, 2024. I think that's oh. the most fitting introduction <laughs> for this show ever right now. Oh, my word. Joining us uh, remotely, Mr. Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. Absolute pleasure to be here. I'm very excited about this interview tonight. Yes, me too. Mr. Jeff Mann is here. Jeff, welcome. Hello from one of the most soft-spoken people in the industry. Soft spoken, except when you talk about PCI, then it's it's then I get spoken. then I get in, in uh, animated. Yes, that is correct. Animated. In, in cryptography, right. four days to go in cryptography. Quick announcement, and, uh, reminder: if you will, Google has announced that they will be shutting down the Google Podcast platform in mid twenty twenty four. In super Google fashion, they're closing it down. Like they've mm-hmm. done. there's a whole yeah. website dedicated to closing stuff down. Yep, it's coming out of beta. Yes, <laughs> to be closed down. That's what they do. When it comes out of beta, they close it down. So to ensure you don't lose access to the Security Weekly content that you know and love, make sure you subscribe to your favorite podcast feeds, which is our feeds, Security Weekly feeds, should be your favorite podcast feeds, uh, on an alternate platform such as Spotify, YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Podcast Attic, Pocket Casts, or anywhere else if you can think of anywhere else where you listen to podcasts do that and just, visit just not on google podcasts not on google podcasts right visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to find the buttons to subscribe to each show and then click the one next to paul security weekly <laughs> and all the other shows and, and, and all the other shows too but the, paul security weekly first yes uh with us this evening jason healy is a senior research scholar at columbia university school for international and public affairs and part-time senior strategist at National Risk Management Center at the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure oh. Security Agency. Is that is that still true? Not, not doing, doing that, that one anymore. No, no, not doing that one anymore. No, I'm just you're I'm just Columbia. Columbia. Right. So I am scratch that up. last part. Prior to this, he founded. Well, prior to this, you were at CISA. Prior to that, he founded the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at the Atlantic Council, where he created the Global mm-hmm. Cyber Nine Twelve Student Cyber Policy Competition. 
He has twice worked for uh, worked cyber issues in the White House, including as a founding member at the office of the National Cyber Director. He is a founding member and past president of the Cyber Conflict Studies Association and a review board member for both DEF CON and Black Hat. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks Thanks for having me. Yes. I, I also hear that he washed dishes at Friendly's in Cranston. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a Rhode Island boy. So, yeah, grew up, grew up, and my very first job washing. Oh, did I leave that as a security question? I don't think it's a security, what am I security? <laughs> yeah. So, first page, uh, first page job. And I wasn't helping my dad selling uh, cre- uh, comic books and baseball cars. I was washing Was that dishes when you were living on Monroe at Street? Restaurant. <laughs> yeah, with my and pet mo- dog, Spot. And, and your mother's maiden name was Smith. Mm-hmm. No, I'm gotcha. kidding. <laughs> so, Jason, how did you get your start in cybersecurity? You know, I, I was in the military, and I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot from Top Gun, the first one, and ended up realizing I was going to be a terrible pilot. And so I turned down a, an automatic job um, as a pilot, right? I was going to be going to pilot training and turned it down so I could compete for job in intelligence. Okay. And uh, made my way into Intel, and um, a lot of the early computer security stuff was being done in those days in the military um, by captains in the Air Force. Like Richard Baitlet came out mm-hmm. of that time, Kevin Mandia, Greg Rattray. Um, There's just a ton of folks that came out of that Kevin era. Kevin Zeiss, um, Scott Waddell. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's an amazing um, Ron I, Gula. I mean, there's a ton, of fo- a ton of folks out of that era. And, um, uh, you know, so I got started early and never really looked away. That's awesome. Hmm. That's awesome. Very nice. Uh, you, you've done a lot of, I will call it policy work. Would you? Would you, what would you call it, Jason? Is that is that an accurate yeah, description? Yeah, uh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I started in policy and cyber threat intelligence. Um, so helped set up um, the first uh, the joint cyber command in the world. And uh, so there weren't wasn't really anybody doing cyber threat intelligence in those days. So there was, um, especially in the government, right? There was a few folks at CIA or NSA or, or DIA. Um, but none of them were operational. So we were the first ones that had to say, okay, what intelligence is coming in and how is that going to help us um, defend uh, the Department of Defense in these places? So we had to come up uh, with a lot of that stuff to characterize adversaries in an operational context, which hadn't been done before. Um, and then was able to go to Goldman Sachs and set up, uh, for Phil Venables. So was able to set up his first um, computer emergency response team, vice chairman of the FSI SAC. So I got a lot of that practitioner. So never really, uh, no, not like, most people in the industry that came up, you know, super hands on keyboard, but I was always in the, okay, what are the adversaries doing and what do we think we ought to do about this? Outstanding. And so what is it you do today? Yeah. And if I can't, you yeah, know, and so that please. really led to, or, you know, part of what we'll, we'll talk about today, right? Because I had a foot in each of these, right? I mean, early going yeah. to Black Hat and DEF CON and a bit of policy, a bit of cyber threat intel, a bit of defense, a tiny bit, not much of offense. Um, you know, so I had this perspective, and it led me to really say, all right, well, um, uh, it, one of the things I wrote the first um, history book for cyber conflict, and I was coming across these quotes um, from, like, none of the known red team efforts to date has failed. I'm like, so, all right, yeah, we know that, right? You know, going to RSA, you're going to hear that in a ton of talks that red team always gets through. And realizing, like, man, that was from 1972, Right, they're actually what? talking about as a tiger team, um, which gives it away, but they meant a red team. And saying, holy crap, we've been at this for 50 years, and these quotes are still true from 50 freaking years ago. Um, and so it really helped inform, like, all right, well, well, as practitioners, right, we're so busy a lot of times with whatever the new patch is or, or working – um, you know, work in the weekends, um, you know, whatever the new Friday night disaster that comes through. And we haven't had a chance to step back and look at how are we doing overall. And so that's what I get to do now. Right now, I'm, um, um, I left Goldman Sachs a second time around 2009, 2010. And so I joined like think tanks and, and universities. So I've been able to have that ability to step back a little bit with that perspective and say, all right, what are the big questions and how are we doing overall? So about half our work, uh, half my work now is on cyber conflict, escalation, um, areas like that. Um, a lot of our work is now on business and systemic cyber risk. Um, we're starting up a, a cyber regulation lab to look at those areas. And this balance uh, in this work about um, or systemic cyber risk. And so this work about, well, how's offense and defense doing, right? This 50 year plus now 
um, uh, a tug of war between the offense and defense. How are we doing overall? Kind of fits in between that. It informs escalation. It also informs things like regulation and systemic risk. Are, do you think we're, we're still doing poorly because red team engagements are still successful? I think it's one of those indicators. And, you know, most of what we, most of, our experience in the field and most of the money and most of what we do is based on enterprises, right? It's individual enterprises and what's happening on, at, at an individual enterprise. And that's good, right? That, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? If you, you know, RSA, right? Most of the, most of the vendors are going to be selling, you know, pitching technology to the vendors. Uh, most of the VC money is going for the, most of the companies that we'd want to build are doing that. Most of our clients are doing that. And that, and that's great. I, but I also like the top down stuff of saying, all right, what are some, what are some indicators that are looking not just at, at the bottom up of each individual enterprise, but what tells us overall about how we're doing. And I, and so like, I think red teams in there is one of those, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it, it kind of bridges between both of those to help us understand. Um, that's kind of at the level of anecdote, right? How hard do they have to get in? Do they, do they not just get in, but can they achieve what they want to achieve? Right. If that were not just a red team, but if it were, um, GRU, if the Ministry of State Security, could they not just get in, but could they, you know, have a larger effect on the United States? It all, well, and it also, and whole. you know, too, Jason, doesn't take into account dwell time either. Like, hey, we got, we got <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. so there, you know, that could be success for the red team. But if they were uh, detected rather quickly, I'd say that's a, a win for the blue team. Yeah, and a lot depends, right? Right now, especially at the nation state level, uh, you know, if if SVR is in your system. Right. They want to sneak around. They want to be relatively quiet. Right. And so if you can limit them in the dwell time um, to days or weeks, that's probably fine. Right. That's not OK with red team. I'm sorry, with um, ransomware groups. Right. Um, right. Right now, the Ukrainians are finding, um, you know, the Russian groups are coming in and doing a lot of smash and grab, um, you know, because they know their dwell time is going to be really short. They're going to get caught quickly. So they're there to just steal emails and, and cause a lot of havoc. So I'm concerned about, well, what happens if, you know, what would it take for um, Russian threat actors or Chinese or Iranian or North Korean threat actors to switch that model where they no longer want to, like SolarWinds, right? S How long was their dual time that, mm -hmm. that um, SVR had in SolarWinds, right? Months. Well, what do you do if, how pissed off would Putin have to be at the United States to say, you know what, I just want to be in, we just get in for a couple of days and we just light the fuses and try and light the whole thing up. Yeah, it's it's interesting. What you're reminding me of as an attacker with a short dwell time was at CCDC competitions where you had people behind yep. the keyboards that knew they were going to be hacked and were yeah. just constantly looking and booting yeah. and booting people off. And it seems like that's also can be the case in the real world as well when there's conflict. Yeah. And, and what I like think about things like dwell time um, is I've only found a couple of these indicators that are already collected that if we were going to say, all right, how are we collectively, like all of us that are involved um, in on the blue side here, are we like, has this 50 years of freaking effort that we've been putting in, have we actually gained on the attackers, right? Um, or are we still running behind? Um, and so there's not most, again, most of our metrics don't look at that. And I found a few indicators, mm -hmm. right? You talked about dwell time, um, right? Verizon data breach investigations report, like they're looking at mean time to detect and mean time to respond, um, which we've seen going down. Now that might be because of ransomware, which wants to get detected or right. You, right? Um, you know, if it's not detected, you don't get paid. So I would love to see what those stats would be like, like if we pull that out or crowd strike breakout times, um, right? We would want to see mean time to detect go down. We'd want to see breakout time goes up. If neither of those is happening, then, you know, we probably, at least in that area, the attackers are probably ahead. And there's a few others like that that I found, but not many. There's, uh, <clears throat> so I mean, as an arms race, hmm. the idea here is that it's going to switch a little bit of constantly. It's going right. to be they're ahead, we're ahead, they're ahead, we're ahead. And so, I mean, are, is it abnormal to see your indicators remain so static? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, have we ever been ahead, right? Is that actually like, you'd expect to see that, right? I think there are times, like, 
if you look back at, we did some work at Columbia. It was called we called the New York Cyber Task Force, and we had a lot of a lot of the you know the the CISOs you'd expect, Phil Venables, Ed Amoroso in that. We had a lot of academics um, like Steve Bellavin and Sal Stolfo that were that were participating. And um, and we asked around, okay, so what have we done as a community over the last fifty years? Like, what have been the best innovations that we have done in technology, operations, or policy? Like. What have we done that's given the defenders the biggest boost at the largest scale and the least cost? And it's not the stuff inside the enterprise, um, right? We invented like passwords or firewalls, which were amazing, but everybody's got to do them and they've got to do them right. And you've got to implement them and you've got to, um, and those tend to add complexity. By far, the stuff that were on the top of people's list, where we really did start to catch up on the defense, were things like the number one, Windows update and automated update generally, right? Mm. It wasn't cheap for, or easy for Microsoft to implement automated update for Windows. What was it with, with, with was that with 98? I think they pushed that out. Mm, I um, think so. Yeah. But, 98 too. And, but right. And, 98 X, version yeah, two. X, and XP really took it to the next level, right? Yeah. It, it was the people who were in the position to make the change. Instead of a, a, a hundred million customers having to all do the right thing you had the person in the position to make the change, make a switch, and then 100 million were able to. And that's where you really get the boom, where you see the deep, you know, the deep end-to-end -end encryption is in there, NAT, um, cloud. I want to I want um, you know. dial in on the Microsoft Windows update, Jason, because I think it's a really interesting yeah, yeah. use case because it also, like, it forced people to update, right? Much like we talk about regulations and guidelines, that. Yeah, which yeah, are, like, yeah. suggestions, but Microsoft's update, like, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of joke today that I don't have a choice. Like, I have to update my Windows machine. Yeah. Like, it's really, really naggy and insistent that I update. That's how important that it is. And that's how much it had to, uh, it had to be that way to push our culture in IT to like, hey, we're like, trains leaving the station. And like, if we're not on it, like, we're going to be pushed on it anyway, <laughs> right? Basically. Yeah. I, I love that because, and that gets to um, one, uh, Paul Kahneman just, just passed away today, right? And he was getting to this with nudge and choice architecture. You talked about this with, with, um, uh, with Josh Corman last week, mm -hmm. right? That, that the secure approach is the simple approach that is the default approach, mm -hmm. right? Bob Lord and others are trying to do this now at CESA with the secure by design, secure by default, right? That, yeah, that, that the thing that is going to help everybody be more secure is the easy and the default path. Right. But it's yeah, also well, going to, really it's also a pain in the butt, up. right? Like, like that's not, <laughs> right, right, right. My, yeah. my wife and I were having this conversation uh, this week because we both had technology challenges that were complicated by security measures. Mm. And it it's usually there is some level of discomfort with it. And that's the usability, if you will, suffers but security makes a great stride. And I think we need to do two things. Like one, we need to be more tolerant of it, but also, too, we need to make it as easy as possible, right? Which is yeah. where maybe Microsoft Which to some gets... degree, Apple has done. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Apple's done some of that. Well, I see. Oh, we were and, talking and, earlier about how not everyone updates their iPhone either, even though Apple's mm, pretty mm, pushy mm, about, about those updates. Yeah. So, But, but yeah, you want to dive into Windows, and, mm. I, and I want to just touch on that a little bit, because what we found in this work from the New York Cyber Task Force wasn't just that where we tend to put our attention, our metrics, our money, which is technology inside the enterprise, you tend not to get the big payout for, right? If you spend X on that, you're going to get X or 2X back. Whereas stuff like Windows Update, end-to-end -end encryption, you might get 10, 100, 1,000 times back on that investment, was that we tend to overlook the operational innovations, right? Windows Update was great, but pairing that with Patch Tuesday and, you know, this operational innovation that, hey, we're not just going to do it automatically, but we're going to do it all on one day, really made it powerful. That made it a lot easier for the for the engineering teams to say, all right, good, we're going to, how we're going to ingest this and we're going to do it in a more normal way. And it made us realize, boy, we tend to overlook the operational innovations, right? Mm. We're all chasing after the new technology, right? Because that's how we're going to be CEOs. That's how we're going to get, get um, you know, get our payoffs. Um but just look at the innovations, right? After the Morris worm, 1988. Like, we didn't have a computer emergency response teams before that. We, we didn't have dedicated teams um, uh, that were going to unpoop the fan 
when things went <laughs> when things went badly. We had to invent that, right? After City Group got hit um, by Vladimir Levin for what ten million dollars in ninety five, right? They invented a, the role of the CISO with Steve Katz. ISACs, nineteen ninety eight. We had to invent that, um, and uh, MITRE now MITRE TAC framework, right? It's not necessarily cheap for MITER and what we put in, but it's cheap compared to the technology, right? Mm -hmm. And it's basically an idea. It's a framework. It's a structure. And just look at how it's helped us. Um, uh, I might not go as far as revolutionize, but really change the way and simplify the way that we, we do a lot of defense. And so we tend to overlook those operational innovations and just how inexpensive they are compared to the to the tremendous gains we get from them. Now, Jason, I mean, the, uh, if we compare the Microsoft Windows update to uh, that solution, to a solution that would address the password issue, and I'll rephrase, I'll, I'm going to relabel uh -huh. password as the authentication issues uh -huh. that yep. we have, one could look at two multi-factor authentication as the solution, but it's not as effective as Windows Update. You agree? Interesting. Yeah. So two things. One, it made it really difficult. Like, there's no we couldn't figure out, especially because I didn't have a big research budget for this, to actually dive in and figure out the actual metrics about how would you measure each of these, so you could do the trade offs of which gave you more security. Um, but passwords were interesting and two factor because we realized you know there's this they have this curve, right? There's um we called it um uh, from essential to albatross. Right at some point, you say, "Oh, here's a new here's a new technology that's come in passwords, that seems promising." And then you realize, "Oh no, this is amazing! Like we can get incredible security gains from this." But at some point, it plateaus, where the investment that you're making in, in dollars, in you know, if you're for your engineering and operations team to be working with passwords, it kind of plateaus, right? You're put you're getting as much security as you're putting into it. Um, um, you know, if you're spending X, you're, you know, it's going to cost the adversaries X to try and bypass it. And then, and then it, it drops off sometimes pretty steeply where what you're continuing to invest in this, like what compliance is telling you, you've got to do passwords is more than the security than you're gaining. And so at that point, you either have to get rid of it. Um, if you, if the, if compliance and regulators let you or, um, decrease your investment to what you're getting out of it. Right, commoditize it, or do like we did with passwords. Add a second factor, so that you now start getting, you know, re-getting those security gains out of it. And to me, like I, I love two-factor because it just shows, right? What was the the Google numbers that showing, right? The the tremendous drop of account takeover, right? I mean, I think they said, you know, out at like ninety-seven percent or or ninety uh, or higher than that. Um, uh, I just like it that you're old enough protection. that you're calling it two factor, not that other's pesky term that's <laughs> entered into the industry. Exactly. Thank you. It was ninety nine point nine percent of uh, wow. attacks wow. got stopped by their. <laughs> uh, it was some ungodly number of millions of attacks got stopped by the fact that they had those uh, tokens. Yeah, but you know, yeah, but I, what's incredible. interesting if we compare Windows Update with multi factor authentication, I think in <sighs> both cases you had to we, say it, didn't you, Paul? I'm sorry. We forced attackers to change their behavior and their strategy. If you talk to mm. folks that do pen testing mm. on Windows today, by and large, they don't rely on vulnerabilities in Windows. They manipulate people, typically mm -hmm. in the form of yeah, right, phishing right, right, attacks, right, right. and then they live off the land inside of a Windows system yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. relying on the fact that a vulnerability is there. And I also think with two-factor or multi-factor authentication, you know, we force attackers to to change, to go after different accounts that don't have the multiple factors, to go after multi-factor authentication itself, right? To change their tactics. Yep. Is that it? Is yep. you think that's a good measurement? Like how it's hard to measure, but like attackers yeah. did change their behavior. Yeah, and that's good. Like, and and if we can get them to change their behavior in ways that make it more difficult to scale, right? What I like about things like end encryption, some of these others that we're talking about is all too often attackers have had a lot of the advantage because the scale offered by the internet helps them. 
They get to scan for all the available machines. They get to use the same attack across a lot of places where defense is diffuse, right? We're not able to use the scale for us because we all have to implement passwords correctly. We all have to buy the right firewall. We all have to keep it maintained we, um, and patched. We've got to integrate it with the rest of our, our enterprise. We've got to train people how to use it correctly. We've got to respond correctly to the alerts. Um, that doesn't scale well. Um, but the, things it goes like back to what you said, uh, Jason, it goes back to what you said earlier, which oh, is good. that would we make effective changes that are automatic, that, that go across mm -hmm. all these boundaries yep. that, that, that do this for us, that we can, um, actually have them happen without like, like when windows updates became automatic, you didn't turn it on. It just right. happened yep. when we can, as a standardized platform, make changes so that, uh, HTTPS everywhere, end-to-end uh, -end encryption, mm -hmm. uh, firewalls. All these things that just got no wait turned on. No wait, no firewalls yeah. is not on that list because actually it is because well, Windows firewall got activated. Yeah. Uh, ten on years the, ago now on the host in impactful network firewalls. Not so much because people no. just opened up the rules and then also you had to actually have one. Like you had to, to your point, Jason. Right? You had you have to go consume a firewall and, and implement it. Whereas in these other cases, it was a more of a natural progression. And so I love these places where we can get scale to work for us, mm -hmm. like on Windows Update. Um, Adam Shostak uh, gave an, another example, um, a security up update 967940 turned off auto run for XP and Vista. Mm -hmm. And that's all they had to do. Like mm -hmm. just switching that default to auto run and the, 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 um, they saw cleans drop by 25%, right? They had a, a, a 1 million fewer cleans per month for over a year just from that single switch. Um, like, I love, the, I love finding those places. For sure. And especially because that's, you know, that's changing a default, right? That's not an expense. This is not expensive code that we've got to do. So now I'm, I'm curious about things like, formal methods about memory safe languages like these other places where you, we can use this investment um because it it's kind of like changing the physics right in a warfare in the land sea air space like you can't change the physics you gotta like you might be able to dig a foxhole but you can't change plate tectonics right and we can in our field because it's all it's all invented and engineered and so this is like really changing that physics of how of of the defense and the offense. It's it's so what's the next physics change? I, I think fully diving into cloud, right? When I was in Washington, DC, the conversation was all the cloud is great, but and I came up here and listened to Phil Venables at Ed Amoroso, and the conversation was the cloud is great and we haven't even begun to get the benefits yet. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Bo Woods talks a lot about how, you know. We have we buy our current software and and we know it's got band aids on it. But he says, you know, it's band aids all the way down, right? Everything <laughs> down to TCP IP and farther down the stack, you know, all has the band aids. Um, it was really Ed Amoroso that convinced me that, like, hey, if you're doing cloud, you're able to do, you know, not completely secure, right? We've got to figure out how to do cloud securely. But you can you can build that infrastructure without a lot of the, those band aids, and the CIO thinks it's his idea because it saves money. Um, does that, it? That's does a change it, though, for I mean, us. Sometimes it saves money. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I like those areas, right? The, the new White House cyber strategy, cybersecurity strategy. Um, I helped draft. Um, uh, parts of is like pushing memory safe languages. It's saying, good, let's try and have this ten year horizon be thinking further out you know we're always getting our butts kicked this week can we start making those investments for 10 years and one i really liked can we can we shift the responsibility we're always dumping the responsibility on the end user um and the organ whether that's an organization or a person like holding the, you know the CISO responsible when we should be putting more responsible for those that are at the center Right, the the government itself, as well as the folks that are providing the software, software liability. Right, if if we see software liability come in, boy, why not? that that's going to be a pretty substantial change. Yeah, I think I want to I want to dive back in on cloud for just a moment because yeah. I don't, I think it's hard to say that cloud just moving to cloud is a general term yeah. is going to afford us more security. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. I think, there, it, but it is definitely. Uh, more feasible 
to implement that secure by design, secure by default, and uh, that ephemeral infrastructure that can, I think, lead to really true security, right? If you deploy something and it's being attacked or it has a vulnerability, you can just redeploy it um, with great ease, way easier than we could in the yeah. past. But not everyone's still catching up to implementing cloud in in that way. And there's a lot yeah. of different uh, options. And <laughs> what we find is that you take an appliance that was a box in a data center, and now it's just a virtual appliance, and you still have most yeah. of the same problems. Yeah. Now, let me ask the, t- the, the, the team here. Um, I'm hopeful that as we're turning out more people that are cloud native and know how to secure, like a lot of this is because, hey, a lot of folks are millennial, right? And we're used to on-prem. And as we're training out more folks that are digital native, that will be out of these growing pains because the companies are cloud native, the infrastructure is cloud native, the people that are using it have always been working in that environment. Do you think I'm being overly optimistic there? Yes. Or do you think... <laughs> yeah, because I, I still think it, it may reduce some of your attack surface, but it also yeah. opens up a different attack surface that you have to defend. Yep. Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say OWATH this: as an example, OWATH as an example, you know, attackers pick yeah. on pick on OWATH, and that's like a whole new attack surface that you yeah. know you're not managing your own exchange servers anymore, but you got to worry about this other configuration and uh, and pockets of technology that that are yeah. getting picked on. I'll say this. Uh, I get what you're saying about the, or what Bo is saying about the, the generations of band aids. And so, okay, cloud computing is somewhat newer, but I don't see anything inherently uh, hmm. less in need of a band aid. We just haven't discovered it yet. Or, you know, in the form of a question, though, what what do you think is so different about cloud computing and, and cloud technologies that makes you think that it's more secure and less less filled with holes that we just haven't discovered yet than previous technologies. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm more going on the consensus of the folks that we were pulling together for the New York Cyber Task Force. Mm-hmm. Um, there is one part, and this is not where you're going with the question of at least you've got some data gravity there. Of you're able to do your analytics, you're able to do the rest, you're able to rebuild rebuild more quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's more to Paul's point than than to your point that you don't have as much legacy that you have to worry about. Right. Mm-hmm. You can, you can work on all new issues. You might have, again, you might have to find them, which I think is your, you might not know what they are, but at the very least you don't have all of these, these legacy stuff that you have to, um, to work through um, in the place was, I think the argument that we were hearing. Gotcha. Yeah. I think, you know, the less organizations that have their own exchange servers, the better we're all, in a better place, right? Well, I mean, I deal with a lot of clients that are in the cloud and and maybe this is still because it's relatively new, but there's still a lot of uh, assumptions going on that, well, I'm in the cloud, therefore it's secure and I no longer have to do anything. <laughs> and I'm always like, well, no, read the small print. Um, yeah. You know the the idea of a of a shared responsibilities matrix, and the and at least the cloud providers are now getting on board with, uh, you know, we need to let you know what you're paying for right up front, so you don't have to mm-hmm. read the small print, and we can do lots of things for you. But as Paul was alluding to, it comes at a cost, and it's not necessarily cheaper at the end of the day. And I would suspect, though, for a lot of the small and medium sized businesses, right, the folks that do have, you know, the, you know. They wouldn't think of it on prem. It's just you know in the back, you know, the computer they run in the back corner. For them, you know, for for uh, the bulk of users, right? Certainly for me personally, mm. right? Being able to just be fully, um, you know, nothing on my laptop. I remember six years ago, no, no, eight years ago, right? I was on the I was on the Amtrak laptop acting up. I was I thought maybe something was going. On. I just closed it. I never used it again. Right. And just being able to do the, uh, you know, back up everything in the cloud certainly made me feel more secure and resilient. So for for many of us are thinking about good or the folks that would hire us as clients. Right. Already is probably a select group um, that would that would recognize our brilliance and be willing to pay us. So um, there's a couple of them like I've been mentioning um, and, and in the lead into the show. Right. What indicators do we have if we're doing better? You know, we talked about some, like we want, we would want to see mean time to detect go down, mean time to respond go down, subtracting out, um, 
ransomware. Dwell time, we would want to go see go down, um, uh, subtracting out ransomware. Um, breakout times go up. There's a few others that, that, that I've come across that help us understand the, the, the big picture as a whole. And I stumbled across a, a few of them um, after having talked to um, uh, Chris Bisopel at Vericode because they're kind of hidden. They're hidden around, and a lot of them aren't always reported as time series, which is what we need. Um, like the uh, uh, Vericode, and I'd want to, I haven't gone, done the work yet to compare this. I only have them for Vericode. I'd want, I'd want to look at others. But right, they've looked at um, all applications scanned by Vericode, um, and they've seen this like substantial decrease over the last six years. Like every measurement has gone down, meaning meaning more secure. Um, if you've seen like um, uh, the two month window of the proportion of applications that had at least one flaw in each flaw category within like OWASP top ten, right? They've seen the decrease of high severity gone from like thirty percent down to like twenty percent over the last six years. Just think about that, right? Of all software scanned by Vericode, they've seen like a one-third reduction in high severity vulnerabilities. Now, again, I, I don't call it a metric because a metric implies there's all sorts of like math and structure behind it. I call it an indicator because it helps us form a hypothesis. Like, wait a minute, if we've seen a one-third, like one-third fewer software scanned by Vericode has a high severity vulnerability. Well, crap. Maybe our maybe our software development lifecycle is getting pretty good. Yeah, but for been for, Ver, for Vericode customers, right? Because we have without yeah, a doubt, yeah. and you preface it, yep, you yep, preface yep. it with that, Jason, right? But yep, yep. I, I think it's, that's it's, a testament it's a to Vericode, but also a testament to the companies that are using Vericode. They're probably paying more attention yep. to the yep. security of their software, and therefore reducing. Uh, those vulnerabilities. We, we hope that trend continues. I think it's a very positive thing yeah. uh, for everyone. But I think there's a lot, of, you know, a lot of software companies yeah. that don't have that initiative. And yeah. it's an unfair metric to say we have more vulnerabilities today than we did ten years ago. Well, of course. I mean, we're writing more code, and we got yeah. better at finding vulnerabilities. So we're going to have more vulnerabilities. Yeah. And so it'll be interesting, right? So to me, that that that's at least something to, like. Hey crap! I got to look more into that, <laughs> right? Um, we need a spotlight and comparing that across. Okay, um, what are we seeing from other vendors? How does that help understand? Um, you know, who's using Vericode so that it helps us understand what segment that they're actually looking at with that measurement. And I'll just give one other one that came came from Vericode, at least for now, because they looked at what you had mentioned, Paul, secure by design. Mm -hmm. Well, they looked at of the software that they scan that scan the first time. Um, it's gone. They've seen this sub sub substantial decrease um, of software that had did, had no known vulnerabilities on first scan. I think that also went down by something like a third over something like six years, um, which again makes you say, "Well, all right." All the caveats, but boy, maybe we're just starting to do better. Maybe we're doing better on secure by design um, than we think. Um, because it's gone down by like a third over six years. It's still like 29.5%. It's still a lot higher than we'd want it, that we might want it to be. Um, but again, it's one of those things that make, all right, there's something to look at here. Maybe um, we're doing better if we're seeing that continue to go down. And so those are the kinds of things I'm interested in for these indicators to say, all right, maybe if we're doing these things, the defense isn't just doing better overall. Because we know we're doing better overall. Yeah, I think. But are it's, we doing it, better relative to the attackers? And it, it's interesting, and it, you know, this I don't have data to back any of this up, right? But right, the if you look at companies like you know uh, Meta and Twitter, and where their software product is their company, and it's used by millions of people, their security bar I think has gotten much higher than. 10 plus years ago. And I, I think that's because it's the nature of their business, but also there's been a renewed focus on it that we just, as you know, when we do web app pen tests, we can't just walk into like a major software organization and find like ridiculous cross-site scripting. Maybe that still happens, but I think less yeah. and less because the attacks I see against the larger infrastructure software providers are typically a lot more complex uh, today and, and mm -hmm. interesting and, and nuanced Whereas the like the low hanging fruit, for lack of a better term, uh, it isn't there today, and I, 
I think if you probably dug into the data in certain segments, Jason, you could probably find some really big wins. Yeah, and you know, I really like to work with folks like Wade Baker at Scientia and and you know the stuff they've been doing with kind of security. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that they've done. Um, I'm really curious because. You know, I watch, I watch cop shows uh, like a lot of folks, and you always see the grizzled cops say, eh? you know, if, if the, you know, we've taken the, you know, all this cocaine off the street and the, and the price is going to rise because we've been seizing the, this cocaine or whatever, and therefore the street, the cost on the street is going to go up. They, they, they always talk about that. I um, don't know if that's true. And so it made me say, well, what does that mean for us you know, in our community? If we see the number just today, Mandiant, um, uh, Katie Nichols and and others had just put out a report of seeing how many zero days are out there. And, and I think the number was up. It's a, it's a, it's a really cool report. Um, if we see the number of zero days go, go, up, go up, does that mean we're doing a good job as defenders or a bad job as defenders? Mm. If the price that's being offered for zero days goes up or down, does that mean we're doing a good job as defenders because they can't use, you know, they have to start using these bespoke expensive vulnerabilities because we're patching all the easy stuff. Hmm. Um, to me, it's a, it's a pretty important question, right? We're focused putting a lot of this attention on the number and cost of zero days that are out there, but we don't actually have a hypothesis that I know of, of what it means if that number or that cost is going up or down. Yeah, I think in, in our case in cybersecurity, I think you can drive the cost up of exploits. And I think that is an effective thing and something we could probably measure. Uh, when it comes to street drugs, uh, I think they're just going to make more drugs. <laughs> <laughs> now, basing that on, right. uh, basing some of that on a podcast I listened to about uh, with a journalist <laughs> that went to uh, WA is the name of the region uh, inside of the uh, country of, I can't remember the name of the country now, um, but it, it borders China, Singapore area, oh, yeah, yeah. right? And they basically made their own country within the country. Yeah. They have their own infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, Bur- yeah it, is, it is from Burma, right? And yeah. they have their own country, like their own governing rules, yeah. water power, the whole thing. And what they do is they make they make drugs. And that's what they yeah. do. And they make a lot of them. <laughs> right? And that's what they focus on is making drugs. So yeah. that's somewhat, I think, of a, you know, kind of un, unfair comparison. And if you flip it to our industry, yeah, when well, we talk about exploits, it's really, it's super hard to make more exploits. We can't just go hmm. set up shops somewhere and, you know, get some chemists to make exploits. It If the software is getting truly more resilient, it is hmm. harder to make them and it drives the cost up. Yeah, but like... Uh, Josh was talking about last week, you know, the, and I forget exactly his phrase, but, you know, the underserved, the, the organizations mm-hmm. out there that can't afford anything, Resource pretty, poor, yeah. pretty hard to convince them that we're doing better <laughs> when they've just yeah. been hit by a ransomware right. attack. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why it's, it's, um, and that's why I like that the national cybersecurity strategy was saying, we can't keep putting the burden on them, mm-hmm. right? If they're getting hit, right. We can't keep saying, well, it's on you because you weren't patching well enough. When we're producing um, code that just has all these vulnerabilities in it, and so um, that's why I like the push from White House and others mm-hmm. to say, "Okay, what can we do to help encourage folks to go to Rust? Um, what can we do to help make it so that we're not giving this, you know, the software that has to get that has such expectations on the end user to get everything right?" Um, uh, now, unfortunately, like, that's what the White House is pushing. I'm not sure the SEC has gotten that memo, <laughs> like the way they're going after CISOs mm-hmm. um, uh, right now. But yeah, so I'm really curious. Like, what are these other things that we can say that the expectations that we can have for the large software companies or the so- or the um, uh, or the internet service providers? You know, what other expectations we can have on them? That's going to reduce that burden for all those poor suckers at the end. You know, it's as you're talking, it, it, it makes me think it's almost like uh, in the judicial system, you know, for adults that should know better, that are making informed decisions to break the law, you have criminal court. But for minors and juveniles whose you know brains haven't formed and don't have the the legal capacity mm-hmm. to make informed decisions, uh, you know. 
they're judged differently. You know, mm. uh, you know, maybe it's a poor analogy, but you know, we we have to treat the underserved and and the and the, and the mm-hmm. resource starved a little bit differently. And how else do you do that? You give them stuff that's secure out of the gate. Uh, whereas yeah. the larger right. organizations, you know, that should know better. So I, I could see both working, is what I'm saying. I could see the White House yeah. efforts working, and I can understand where the SEC is coming yeah. from as well. And one, you know, to flip, you know, a lot of our work here is looking at cyber conflict, cyber warfare. And one of the reasons I really like, because here we are, we can talk about wanting to improve defense to help those folks on the on the edge, um, so they're not getting hit by ransomware. That helps us a lot on stability, right? One of our concerns is that you know, if if um, Russia or China or Iran, nobody on this show really... is stable. But keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if someone really decided, for example, to, to weaponize the ransomware, like to really hit the United States or, um, you know, we've made it easy because the bar to cause substantial damage is relatively low. You know, we're making that especially worse with, um, you know, the more we take, um, you know, cyber physical systems and having that online, um, you know, easily identifiable and showed in. And you know, um, uh, Josh did a good um uh, uh, folks, if you haven't listened to last week's show with Josh Corman, I recommend you do because he covered this really well right here, Paul Security Weekly. And all uh, 821 um, episodes before that, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he does a really good job about about talking about taking these things off, right? We need to do that for security, but also the more that we can do that, we're raising the bar of who we're allowing to be able to attack our infrastructure for potentially a substantial hit. Raising the bar for software security is especially challenging. I think it was Gary McGraw on mm. an episode of this show uh, was telling a story where they literally rewrote star copy uh, in C so <laughs> that it was secure. They took it away. They took away the, the vulnerable version of it. Right. And the developers just like rewrote the vulnerable version back into the code. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> and that, oh. that always, oh, no. that story always kind of stuck with me as one of those really challenging things to securing software today and i think that's also compounded by the amount of legacy software that was written before we had a lot of the tooling and awareness that we do uh today for software and so i i think it's it's super challenging jason i'd love to hear your thoughts on you know what 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 can we do what are we doing today to, to raise this bar yeah, a couple of things. So one, I've, I've mentioned the memory safe languages, which is, you know, we're starting to, to, to do more of that. Um, you know, uh, I learned, you know, in for those of us taken that have listened or had academic classes on computer security, you might have learned about formal methods. And I remember it was, a you know, saying, man, this is this is a cool idea, but this is this is never going to be useful, right? Maybe this is something the DoD is going to pay for. And then I was learning um, a couple of years ago, I don't know if they finished the project, but Microsoft was using formal methods on a lot of the core uh, core protocols they needed to do, like provably secure um, to substantially increase um, the security, security of those. Um, Paul, we were talking the other day and you mentioned there's a DARPA project called HACMS, H-A-C-M-S, which they had done a drone helicopter where they used these formal methods, which I thought was, again, it was a classroom thing. I never thought it'd be practical. And they were, we were able to bring down by like two orders of magnitude, how much it, it, it costs to write, write code in this manner. And they gave the red team part of, um, they gave them access to one part of the helicopter software and they couldn't break out of that the red team failed even having initial access because the code was was provably secure like man that that stuff again it can't just be experiments right it ha- we have to get it out um but i really like those kinds of things and i really like where that the white house is now is, and others are really pushing on code for open source um and we've got a metric for that um, going back to Vericode again, um, this is just because they published this in an easy to come across form. Um, the metric I like there is flaws, um, is, um, 29.5% of applications do not have a flaw in an open source library when they're first scanned. Right. I like that. Right. If going through and seeing in those libraries, what they've got, um, uh, within open source, um, see if they have any known OWASP, um, top, whatever, 
um, vulnerabilities, that's a great way of figuring out if we are since those libraries are getting pulled down for so much code nowadays. Yeah, it has to be when a trickle it, it has to be a trickle down effect because I could use formal methods and write really, really secure software, but then I import a library like Log4j and it's game over. So it's like the yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the down you know, yeah. upstream or downstream, yeah. however you want to want to put it, is it has to also but also on libraries though, applying formal methods to these libraries that we're relying on mm. is I think uh, a good way to improve the overall state of software security yeah. such that mm -hmm. these libraries aren't so vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, to give you a, to and, give you a fun little one too I, I this struck me about rewriting string copy and and so forth um, one of my coworkers teaches um, I, I want to say university level and they're working on some Python stuff and uh, to read from him one of my students created an import.py in one of their projects with a def import parentheses inside and from their main python program had the line from import 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 mm. <laughs> god uh, that hurts my yeah, brain. yeah. Uh. I, I made my mustache curl extra there excellent um, it, so another one um, is the number of open source libraries with published proof of code um exploit a uh, proof of concept exploit code right Good. That that's something that we can set a goal on as a community, or or from from the White House level or wherever, and saying, you know what, whatever that is, let's let's cut that down, right? If we're bringing that down, um, that number, boy, that helps everybody. I'm really curious what everyone thinks about AI, right? Because theoretically, uh, you know, I'm always curious. Like, uh, I'm all about what's going to help offense preferentially versus defense, you know. And so I'm really curious. You know, is AI um, gonna preferentially aid the defense versus uh, versus the attackers. Um, so far, it sounds like it's been helping the defenders. From what I've been hearing from CISA, Royal Hansen, from from Google, had said that. Um, I'm curious, Paul. What have you been hearing on the show? I, you know, do attackers need AI technology <laughs> to do accomplish their goals? successfully and i think the answer is no and that's mm -hmm. why largely mm -hmm. we haven't you know we haven't seen that trend i think it will continue on the attacker side as 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 an uh, as needed basis right because today they're going after you know an organization or systems and the vulnerabilities that exist there are five years old and so why yeah. i don't know yeah to to navigate those waters right but yeah. I, you're, we probably are seeing adoption. Um, my gut tells me that in one of the advanced groups that are looking for exploits are most likely using AI technology to help help them in those tasks. So I think you're, we're going to see pockets of it. It'll probably continue. Mm -hmm. On the defender side, I think you're right. I think it's, it's a great tool for a lot of things, for automation, for uh, finding vulnerabilities in code, for developing proof of concepts. Uh, so I think it's helping us tremendously. I saw some, um, there are some stat, the, the um, stuff that makes me worry is I just feel like in almost every general purpose technology feels like it's aided the attackers more than the defenders. Um, and, it, and I know at DEF CON, what was it? It wasn't 10 years ago, was it? When they had the AI, the supercomputers on stage? That was, yeah, you're right. It's probably uh, 10 years ago. That was about 10 years ago. Yeah, the DARPA, the, the DARPA Cyber, Cyber Grand, Grand Challenge. Challenge. Yeah, from yep. DARPA, um, which if, if, if listeners haven't, followed this take a look i mean it was super cool i mean they had these computers on i think four or five supercomputers on stage that were doing this automated capture the flag against each other it was it was absolutely stunning and super and, and cool to watch and but one of the teams i think it was mayhem the the it was mayhem which was out of carnegie mellon they found that when they would apply the supercomputer to 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 real code like they were able to just generate Dozens, if not hundreds, of, vul of new vulnerabilities, um, yep. arguably faster than they could actually be patched by the vendor. And so that's one of those things that's always left me a little bit pessimistic here, is that if we're able to use these for vulnerability discovery, that's great and, and c might help us as defenders, but only if we're able to patch it that just quickly. As, just as fast. That quickly as well. Yeah. That's why yeah, we need yeah. to use AI so, to be able to patch it. Well, we can make the patches me. with it. Right. <laughs> Deploying them right. and installing That's them is a different, different story. Different right, story. right, right, right. And, um, and it always bugged me that DARPA was doing this 
in part to help the offense, right? They were doing it not just to find and fix vulnerabilities, but to also to use those and weaponize them ag against the other supercomputers. I think, no, attackers have enough. <clears throat> now DARPA is doing, I think they're committing something like $20 million um, in their um, cyber AI challenge. Yeah, is what they it, did is, uh, is what tra it's trail, a bit, trail a bits, but it was one of the winners of that. Uh, mm. Grant program, I believe. I believe that's the same program. Oh, I missed that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Dang it. Dan Tanguido, right here in, yeah. in New York. Um, yep. uh, sorry, I was waving out my window because I'm, I'm facing south towards Manhattan nice. here. And um, <laughs> I didn't. He's and, waving um, back. This, Can you see? That's right. <laughs> and it's a purely defensive challenge, right? It's just about oh, you know focusing on using AI to get deep. And that, that to me, I, I love, right? Good. Let's not, let's not spend mo a DARPA money to help offense. But yeah, if we can figure out not just how to find these vulnerabilities, but to patch them quickly at scale. Oh, that's sexy. That, that, that's like mustache twirly sexy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like how you roll. <laughs> uh, off topic a little bit. Yeah. To, to me, thinking about the the Cyber Grand Challenge, and this is a completely you know different down a rabbit hole. That was like to me one of the last years that they really seemed to make a spectacle of the CTF huh. at DEF CON. To me, huh. like I, I seem to remember going the last couple of years. You know, granted COVID aside, that like CTF involving real humans didn't seem to be that much of a spectacle. It was just kind of off in the corner of this room and mm. like there wasn't all the big flashy lights and the big screens and like it used to be with some of the other stuff. And I wonder if just none of those groups wanted to pick up any of that showmanship anymore mm. and it became yeah, more of a subtle waving thing. Yeah. Well, also there's well, a just, lot of CTFs today. Yes. True, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is good. I mean, I'd say that I, I didn't mean to have that sound negative. I think it's right. a positive thing that we right. have so many CTFs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two, I'll, I'll mention two things, uh, if I can. Uh, one is, uh, in the run of the show, you'd mentioned the Cyber 912 uh, Strategy Challenge, which I, I founded you know, 10 years ago or so, because that was for folks on the policy side. right? Mm -hmm. We've got lots of technical folks. right? We've got a lot of competitions um, in CTS for the technical folks. But I wasn't seeing folks that would help the actual policymakers to be better when they're students, right? For them, for us to reward them for understanding our field. And so now I've had like probably over 5,000 students go through this. We've been through, um, you know, we've been around like 15 cities worldwide um, that the Atlantic Council runs uh, to help them understand that. And also DEF CON has gotten a lot, oh, Black Hat as well. But thanks to Jeff Moss, DEF CON really pays attention to the policy side now. Yes. Um, and I know that probably disappoints some of, the, some of the hardcore hackers. But if we say, hey, we need folks in Congress, for example, to be better, we need the White House to understand this better. Um, uh, Bo Woods has helped build that out. Jeff Moss has made it a priority. It was lonely for me being on the bo review board and being the policy guy, um, especially you know 10 years ago, because uh, it's a hacking conference. Mm -hmm. But thanks to Jeff. Um, you know, it's really come a long way, and and I think that really, and, and I think that really speaks to the community too. Is that so many of those yeah. folks that were in that community early on have moved up in their career, mm, and mm, they mm. now really need to be concerned about some of those types of things? Because quite honestly, that's yep. where I probably spent yep. a fair amount of time was in some of the policy village last year because my career it, has progressed into that type a, of. That's activity. a great point, right? When I I. You know, when we started the Cyber Statecraft Initiative, I had like three people come to me all within like within two weeks and say, I'm not making the impact on the technology side and I need to figure out, you know, and we, I need to do this. I had a Jeff Moss, Dimitri Perovich, and Richard Baitlick. And I was like, all right, I think we're on to something here um, to try and make this happen. And so, and now that the White House has made the Office of the National Cyber Director, um, ONCD had, I think, 12 people at DEF CON hmm. last year. Like, it was a serious commitment. Normally, at White House, there's only 12 people total that work cyber, and that's offense and defense within the National Security Council. And here you had them make this real commitment to say, we got to get out there. We've got to understand better. They had a challenge badge, right? They had a White House badge, and you could scan it, and it would take you through um, uh, just for like, so they're, they're really working hard to understand our community. Um, and I think that's just going to lead us to, to, um, a lot better outcome. I remember I was walking through the white house complex. We we're in the new executive office building and I walked around one corner and there were these folks with blue hair. 
there was Bo Woods, there were all these other folks. And I felt like my communities were coming together because we were having these hackers that were there to review the national cybersecurity strategy, yeah. right? The White House reaching out to bring in the, the, the hardcore blue hair hacking community um, to say, here's what we've drafted. Does this make sense to you? We've come a long, long way, especially from the post Snowden era, right? When, yep. when dark tangent basically uninvited the government folks. Yeah. Sign me up. Like that, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. Uh, I would, I was, oh, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, I, I was, <laughs> you know, I was posting on LinkedIn today. Cause you know, that's now what my life consists of is that I post on LinkedIn <laughs> instead of Twitter or something. Like you way. sexy beast. I yeah. know. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was response to a post and reposting of some stuff that if you had asked me 20 years ago, if I thought um, government regulation and policy was the way to solve some of our computer problems, I'd have laughed at you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah, 20 yeah. years later, I'm like, well, some of this stuff is a pretty damn good idea. And I think that may be because some of our blue haired compatriots are showing up to, to offer comments and, and some of those types of things. Well, and to tie it back where I started, right? We've seen, right? These quotes from 50 years ago are showing that like we haven't made progress. Um, you know, think of all of the, the tens of billions of dollars we've spent. Think of all of the... Um, the people's careers that have started and finished. Think of all of the missed kids' birthdays and the missed and the worked weekends that we as a community have done over those 50 years. And we have not fundamentally shifted some of these fundamental facts that like the offense gets through. One of the other quotes um, was, um, uh, unless security is designed into a system from its inception, there is little chance that can be made secure by retrofit. 1972. It's called the Anderson Report. It was done for the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> Unless security is designed into a system from its inception, there's little chance it can be made secure by retrofit. We have known for 50 years that we need to secure yeah. by design. So you when can't some bolt it on, what? Come on, <laughs> right? You can't bolt it on. It bolts on fine. So for Jeez. someone to say, no, we don't need liabilities for software vendors. We can figure this out with volunteer. Like once you say no, it's been 50 years and we haven't figured this out yet, it makes me a lot friendlier to liability for software manufacturers um, for producing code that can't be updated. They don't have a kind of coordinated vulnerability disclosure program um, uh, and the rest. Um, all of a sudden, I feel a lot friendlier to that than I would have, like you said, Larry, like than I would have been 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, when I understand, wait a minute, our grandparents were working on the same problems and coming to the same conclusions and we're suffering. And I, I want, you know, to put it in other terms, I want a sustainable internet, right? I want our grandkids when they're our age to have an internet in a cyberspace that is at least as awesome as the one that we have today. Nice. And forget our grandparents working on that. Jeff was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff is my granddad. Oh. I am. Sorry, Jason, so no, Jason, I, I just have. Uh, we just have five questions left for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? All set. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, bald and brilliantly mustachioed. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um. Uh, poison, because no one would expect it. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? It was never supposed to be like this. What is your favorite hacker movie? Oh, oh it's got to be War Games. I'm going to come back to that at the end. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. <clears throat> um, Matthew Broderick and Ali uh, Sheedy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you thought you were coming yeah. back to War Games. Sorry, <laughs> um, I will go. I will go with the couple. I can't remember. Um, Myrna Loy and oh, in the Thin Man, and whoever her husband was was in oh. in the Thin Man. Oh, Classic couple. Um, Claude Rains. No, yeah, yeah um, from the Thin Man. And and I'm gonna come back because we uh, with Bow Woods and others, we were doing a um, a hacker film festival called Defrag, and we did an event where we had Jen Easterly, we had Matt DeVoe, we had Amelia Caron, and we had General Kevin Hike who was the director of operations for NORAD. And we had them together and talk about why War Games was such an excellent movie. <laughs> so this, Jace, this head of operations for NORAD saw um, War Games when he was in high school 
and it made him want to go into computer security. He goes to the Air Force Academy, becomes a fighter pilot, and then he's at and actually running security for NORAD. And so we get to ask questions like, so was it accurate? Oh, it was great. It was so cool. It's absolutely accurate. <laughs> Je, you know, Jen Easterly, would you hire David Lightman? I would definitely hire David Lightman. So if you go to my Twitter, Jason Healy, I have that pinned at the top and you can watch that. Um, we also have a short documentary um, with Bo about hackers talking about their favorite movies. Mm. Um, and so I know that's a that's a uh, um, something that is close to, to a lot of you here. I'll send you that link, Paul. Yeah, that'd be awesome. awesome. Sweet. And maybe we can include it in the uh, uh, maybe we can include in the, it in, notes, the, yeah. in the link to the to the episode. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jason, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, vendors. Thanks, um, sponsors. Um, uh, and thanks to the listeners. Appreciate it. And with that, we will take a short break and come back with the security news. Stay tuned.